Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's special presentation webinar mini series. I'm Ben Rue, Program Coordinator here at the Forum on Workplace Inclusion. I am pleased to have you here for today's webinar, Inclusive Leadership in a Virtual World, with presenter Stephen Frost of Frost Included. This is the second in a special two part presentation on diverse equity inclusion during this global pandemic and beyond. We hope you enjoy this experience and find this information helpful in your work and join us for future webinars. <laughs> Today, Stephen will be presenting for about 45 minutes with Q&A at the end. Due to recent security issues, the chat will not be opened, um, but please utilize the Q&A feature to ask any questions. There will be polls throughout the webinar, so we encourage you to participate in those. At the end of this webinar, you'll be asked to fill out a brief survey on your experience. Please take a moment to fill out this survey as your feedback helps us shape future webinars. We truly appreciate your open and honest feedback. Today's webinar is SHRM and HRCI eligible. The activity IDs will be provided at the end of this webinar. It is also being recorded and will be broadcast and being broadcast live on Facebook. The recording will be posted onto our website within the next week. Uh, visit our website forumworkplaceinclusion.org or on Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn for more information. Before I hand things over to Stephen, I would like to share a brief message from our Executive Director, Steve Hummerkaus. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Steve Hummerkaus. Like so many of us in this new virtual role, I'm speaking to you today from my home in North Minneapolis. As you may know, the forum is dedicated to providing the very best learning and development programming for diversity, equity, and inclusion education. During regular times, we provide webinars and podcasts on a variety of topics on a monthly basis throughout the year, as well as our flagship conference in the spring. During these virtual times, we are working even harder to present more programming for you, including some specific to the COVID-19 pandemic and its impact on our workplaces, ourselves, and especially underserved populations. That is, of course, the topic of today's webinar. We provide most of our resources like this webinar for free. We're able to do this thanks to the generous support of our community. We know these resources have great value to you since so many of you are regularly participate and we're so grateful that many of our virtual offerings are actually full beyond capacity. However, like many other organizations, we are experiencing challenges due to the pandemic. In order to sustain our work, we have added a donation button to our website and to each podcast and webinar page. We ask that you donate what you feel is the value of this service to help us continue to bring the very best DEI training to you and for us to fulfill our mission of engaging people, advancing ideas, and igniting change. Every donation is fully ta tax deductible. Thank you for your support of the form of workplace inclusion, and we hope you enjoy today's webinar. Thank you, Steve, for that message and for your leadership during this time. Without further ado, I would like to hand thing over to Mr. Stephen Frost. Thank you very much, Ben, and hello, everybody from London, England. I hope this finds you and your loved ones safe and well. Um, I'm conscious that in terms of our programming for this, we've got folks joining us from the West of the Americas, so good morning to you, and I hope I'm not interrupting your breakfast. Uh, we've got folks on the East Coast, and so one up a tea for lunch, and for those folks joining us uh, in Europe and indeed in Asia, uh, I hope this will uh, be uh, interesting for you before you finish your day too. So that's great. Um, in terms of just a little introduction to me, uh, I started um, at the uh, formal workplace inclusion with a keynote in 2012 when I was the head of diversity and inclusion and chief of staff for the London Olympic and Paralympic Games. And the title of that keynote eight years ago was the inclusion imperative, something I subsequently wrote about, the inclusion imperative. And here we are eight years on, and I think actually the imperative of inclusion is even more present um, today in the crisis we find ourselves in and in the challenges and the opportunities that presents. So I'd like to say a huge thank you to Ben and a huge thank you to Steve and indeed all the staff at the forum who do such important work, not only themselves, but also in convening other thought leaders from around the world to generally share best practice and diversity inclusion. Without them, this wouldn't happen. So huge thanks to them. And of course, huge thanks to all of you for joining in. I appreciate how busy you are. And indeed, in these times, it's almost like, you know, we have back-to-back -back webinars, phones, and conversations, and so forth. 
So I hope that you find this a really good use of your time too. I have the privilege of knowing many of you on today's webinar already, and I can see we've got well over 500 of you joining. So I'd like to say a big thank you and a big hello to all of those I already know. For those of you I don't know, uh, I teach and I write and I consult on diversity and inclusion and have done for many years. So I do a lot of teaching at business schools, such as Harvard in the States, Sciences Po in Paris, and SMU in Singapore, to try and get people to think about diversity and inclusion as a core part of leadership, which is indeed what we're gonna be discussing today. I've also written a few books on the topic and try to work with wonderful organizations around the world on embedding this in their decision-making. So this is truly about inclusive leadership in a virtual world. So I'm just gonna um, share a presentation with you now, and I hope you find this um, really uh, uh, interesting. So inclusive leadership in a virtual world. If any of you are on Twitter, please feel free to link in with me at, at Frost Included, which is there. And of course, for any of you who've got questions and answers, please make a note as we go through, and we'll do our very best to get to as many of them uh, in the end as we possibly can. What I'm gonna talk through in the next half an hour or so is inclusive leadership in a virtual world. And it's really thinking about inclusion, not just as an end in itself, but actually as a critical compass for how we navigate this new map, how we navigate this new world. The inclusion imperative is such that inclusion has never been more important. And the decisions that people are making right now, that you're making right now, that our colleagues and bosses and friends are making right now, are even more important. But the irony is that many of them may be making decisions right now on a system one frame of thinking, perhaps from a position of fear or weakness. And actually, this is something we need to be very conscious of because we need the exact opposite right now in terms of making good inclusive decisions that benefit us, our teams, our organizations, and the world at large. So in terms of thinking of inclusion as a compass to help us on this new map, this new virtual world, I'd like to start off by asking you all a question. I'd like to start off by asking you our first poll. And Ben, I think you're gonna help me on this. I'd like to ask all of you who are online now, how are you feeling in your body and mind right now? If you could let us know from a scale of one, terrible, to five, great, it would be really great at the beginning of this webinar for us to get a sense of how everyone is on the call. So I'm gonna give you just a few more seconds to, to vote, and then we can all collectively get a sense of how people are feeling in their body and mind right now. So Ben, I think we're nearly there. And we've closed the poll and it's a classic bell curve. Uh, we've got six of you who are feeling terrible and I wanna reach out to you in particular. We've got 27 of you who are feeling absolutely great. Uh, but the majority are in a classic bell curve somewhere in the middle. So we have you know, nearly 250 of us on this call who are not feeling terrible, but not feeling great either. What I'm gonna do is we're gonna take that exact same poll at the end of this webinar and see if there's been any change. But I want to particularly reach out to people who are feeling not so great right now and say, uh, you're not alone. Uh, I hope the skills on this webinar will be helpful to you personally as well as professionally, and we'd love to pick up with you afterwards. So that's our baseline. That's how we're starting off. And I want to start off, I guess, with some empathy for the knowledge that um, right now, a lot of people are feeling very discombobulated, very, very fearful, very, very afraid. You know, we cannot downplay the seriousness of the situation. And so in terms of how people are feeling right now, uh, empathy springs to mind. Uh, we know people that have lost their lives. We know people that have lost loved ones. And of course, besides the health crisis, there's an economic one. And I don't for one minute want to downplay the importance of this and the severity of the situation. However, what I also want to do in this is to give hope. To give hope that actually we have been through crises before and there are specific things that we, the people on this call, can actually do to help. I think back to eight years ago at the London Olympic and Paralympic Games that I mentioned in my opening. In many ways, we were facing some crises then, crises of terrorism, crises of stakeholder management, politics, budget, 
economic and political pressures. But actually from this crisis came real opportunity. And we were able during the course of those games to really shift the debate from seeing diversity and inclusion and from seeing inclusive leadership as an opportunity cost to actually being a methodology. So this is important framing right up front, that rather than organizations downplaying diversity inclusion and seeing it as a net cost, as an additional thing which needs to be deprioritized, we actually see it as a methodology, actually as a way of doing business that can help us all. So I want to do a reminder at the very beginning that leadership is of course about behaviors. Leadership is about what we do. And therefore it's important to reflect on our own behaviors. And during the course of this webinar, Inclusive Leadership in a Virtual World, I want to take us from the big picture, what's going on in the world, down to diverse inclusion in our organizations, and then end with us personally, as individual human beings, leaders, and professionals. So starting big and coming down to a very, very specific call to action by the end with five key points. But this all stems from behaviors, how we as people behave. Now let's get some definitions on the table to begin with. Inclusive leadership is valuing, seeking out and leveraging our differences. This is critical for psychological safety. If people don't feel included, then they don't feel psychologically safe. And if people aren't psychologically safe, they're not gonna speak up and contribute to decisions, which could be critically important. It's because of low psychological safety that we end up with driverless cars that actually have a racial bias and are more dangerous for folks from ethnic minority backgrounds than from white people. Actually, it's because of psychological safety being low that we have vaccines and health outcomes that are unequal between men and women. And it's because of low psychological safety that we don't have people speaking up in crises. And think back to 2008 and the financial crisis, and think back to all those really brilliant women and men who were too afraid to speak up to challenge decisions, and we saw the consequences of their exclusion. Inclusive leadership is also about an open mind. The problems and the challenges that we're facing right now are beyond the capacity of any one person, no matter how amazing we might think we are. An open mind is a prerequisite to being an inclusive leader, as is active listening. Active listen to, listening doesn't just mean acknowledging, it means hearing, playing back, affirming, and of course being transparent in the decisions that we make. This is inclusive leadership. And to be clear, Inclusive leadership is not involving everyone in everything because that can become tokenism quite quickly and it can be disconnected from the actual needs of the organization. And it's not including difference for the sake of it. Again, tokenism potentially. It's about actually the real value that comes from including people for moral as well as clear business and commercial reasons. So I hope that gets us all on the same page in terms of what inclusive leadership is that we're gonna be talking about in this virtual world. So let me start big and come down. Let me start with these mega trends, these big pictures of what's going on in our world right now. And I want to offer four for you to consider. The first is very much political. There's a quote here from Greta Thunberg. We don't want these things done by 2050, 2030, or even 2021. We want them done now. There is an increasing appetite for instant change, instant uh, results. And of course, this is in the context of globalism versus nationalism, a conversation we had only a month and a half ago in Minneapolis, when we were having a conversation around the competing forces of increased need for globalism to tackle climate change and indeed pandemics, but at the same time, they're being a renewed nationalism and are looking in. How do we reconcile those competing trends and how do they manifest themselves in our workplaces? Another mega trend we should be aware of is economic. Now this is a scary statement for many of us on this call because many of us will be working at S&P 500 companies. But I'm afraid the news is that the average age of an S&P 500 company is now less than 20 years. Most of the S&P companies that we know will not be around by the end of our careers. And this is an incredible testament to the pace of economic change. Again, 
if we want to have a business case for inclusive leadership, it's to anticipate these changes, to include them in order to be more resilient and mitigate risks. We know the examples of Kodak, Nokia, Swiss Air, Lehman Brothers, and they were directly correlated with a failure to include different people and different perspectives. A third mega trend is of course technology, which is allowing us to come together today, distant, but included. The most important thing about a technology is how it changes people. This is a really important thought for us to dwell on, but actually we're not having these trends happening in isolation, but they're affecting how we behave, how we include. Technology gives us the potential to include more than ever before. And we'll come on to some very specific things in a moment, but it also gives us the opportunity to exclude if we're not consciously including. It gives us the opportunity to polarize if we're not consciously bringing people together. And the final mega trend for us to be aware of is of course social. That once social change begins, it cannot be reversed. And if I may just have a moment of optimism at this juncture, whilst right now there is definitely a lot of crisis, a lot of things that people are fearful and worried about, we should also reflect on how far we have come. It actually, social change for many people, for many of us, has given us far greater rights and inclusion than we've ever had before. The challenge is to build on that and to take heart from that to ensure that we don't go backwards at this juncture. So where am I going with all this? Well, where I'm going all with this is to make a really key point that I think is important for all of us who care about inclusive leadership to be very aware of. Ladies and gentlemen, we are living in a time of forced innovation. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, hopefully in front of you right now, you're able to see a very simple graph, a very simple quadrant, which basically pits technology against market change. And pre-COVID, many of us were operating and many of us were working for organizations that were in the bottom left segment, incremental innovation. In existing markets with existing technology, we were actually busy doing small minor tweaks to other work that we were doing. But things have changed. Actually, the market's new, technology's new, and I would go so far as to say that the current time we're operating in, this new virtual world, is actually multiple variables changing at the same time, which leads us to radical innovation, the top right quadrant. Let me give you some examples of this. Incremental innovation would be, for example, changing the packaging on a product. It's a small innovation that doesn't change much, but it moves us forward. Disruptive innovation, the bottom right, would be, for example, the launch of the iPhone. Can we remember a time before the iPhone when actually the iPhone was being developed in stealth and then was released on the world and overtook all its competitors within a year? The top left is architectural innovation. Take, for example, NASA. NASA spent many, many times and money developing airline safety cushions and working out how they can improve airline safety. But actually that technology was pivoted and used for memory foam mattresses, which now allow us to have a good night's sleep. But it's really this top right corner of radical innovation that's before us right now. And so in the midst of this crisis, when the market's changed, the technology's changed, when indeed our thinking about health generally has changed, we're in the space of radical innovation. And that allows us a choice it allows a choice to deprioritize inclusive leadership because we've got other things to worry about, or it gives us an opportunity to double down on inclusive leadership because it gives us the opportunity to take advantage of this incredible opportunity to make things happen. How long have we been campaigning for remote working or for flexible working? And suddenly some aspects of that are arriving. How can we capitalize on these opportunities to ensure that this radical innovation can be positive? Let me pause right there in this time of forced innovation and bring us to a second poll to get some more input from all of you. This future at a high level that I've just mapped out, this new virtual world, does this future excite you or does this future scare you? So Ben, I'd be very grateful if we can run this poll, and ask folks, does this future excite you or scare you? And if you could vote, that'd be really, really helpful. Can we get another sense of where you're at at the moment?
So I'm really pleased there's huge engagement here and you know, two, well over two thirds of the 627 people online have voted. And as we are about to close poll, thank you, Ben. It would seem actually we have a bias in favor of excitement about the future, which is fantastic. But again, I don't want to forget those folks who are quite scared by this future. So we've got five folks who are scared by this future, uh, but the bell curve has definitely shifted towards the positive end of being excited about that future, which sets us up quite well for the next part of this webinar. I want to kind of come down now to you and your work and the organization and talk about diversity and inclusion specifically. And I'm going to be quite provocative here which I hope is okay, but it definitely might provoke some Q&A later on. With diversity and inclusion, and I'm speaking from London, England here, but I do a lot of work in the US, in Asia, and other parts of the world. I'd like to offer some thoughts, which you know might of course be culturally specific to certain parts of the world, but might also be of interest to you in terms of frameworks and where you're thinking about your work in this new virtual world. The challenges are that in this new world, particularly right now, people are reverting to system one thinking. The amygdala is dominating over the neofrontal cortex. System one is dominating over system two. People are sensing fear for opportunity. And that of course means that bias in in-groups may be reinforced, that actually COVID could exacerbate pre-existing inequalities and lead to lack of trust and hyper-individualism. That fundamentally, the challenge of right now is, like I said before, that this new possibilities actually reinforces pre-existing inequalities and we need to challenge that. But the flip side of this is, of course, hope. The idea that instead of system one thinking, thinking quick, thinking impulsively, we can be conscious more than ever before about the decisions that we're making. And actually that greater consciousness can lead to more community, new connections and greater personalization. You and your roles have a critical role to play because as diversity inclusion practitioners, we know that system two thinking doesn't just happen, that we actually have to consciously shift from system one to system two. And it's precisely at moments like this that we need to do that ever more. So here's the irony. Right now, we're more likely to be in system one, but right now we need system two more than ever before. And for myself, having the privilege of working with some frontline medical staff, with doctors and with nurses, if they can do it in life and death situations on the front line, to just breathe, to pause, to lock themselves in a cubicle, to just reflect for a moment, and to take three or four seconds to shift to system two thinking, it will have tangible impacts on the decisions that you subsequently make. Instead of fear, we can have greater consciousness. Instead of those bias and in-groups being reinforced, we can have greater community. In terms of lacking of trust, we can actually have new connections. How many have you been able to reach out to different people on LinkedIn? How many have you been able to call on people who may actually be isolating on their own right now? How many of you have been actually able to subvert the hierarchy of your organization and reach out to people in different departments that normally would involve a long walk around an office? How instead of hyper-individualism can we have personalization and greater thinking about the other person? It's never been more important to prioritize the platinum rule. The platinum rule, of course, is that we should treat others as they wish to be treated. And that's something that's so important, I think, for us to do at this time. So let me ask my third out of four polls before I come down to the personal level that I want to get to. So far, I've asked you, how are you feeling in your body and mind? We've asked, how are you feeling about the future? And the third out of four polls that I want to ask you is how ready and prepared is your organization for this future? Thinking about that choice of greater diversity inclusion or actual real challenge to diversity inclusion, the challenge versus the hope, where do you think your organization is? And of course, this is an anonymous poll, so you can be completely honest if your organization is not prepared at all, but I'd be grateful if you could vote between not at all and totally embracing it. So 
So again, thank you so much. We've got a really high engagement level on this voting, which is great. And again, a classic bell curve. We have a few folks whose organizations are not at all ready for this future. Well, give us a call. Um, but we've got quite a few that are, or at least think they are. Um, and I hope this isn't all, you know, overconfident men hubris. I hope it's reflective system two thinking here. But it would appear we've got a, a classic bell curve of actually most organizations are somewhere between complete unpreparedness and true embracing of this future. That shows us that there's work to do, but it shows us that this is definitely a not unachievable task. Thank you so much for giving us that information. So I just want to kind of move towards the final part of this webinar and bring it down to some really practical things that we can think about as inclusive leaders in this new virtual world. And I put up here a memory from eight years ago at the London Olympic and Paralympic Games. And again, the point I made at the beginning of this webinar, that we have a choice as human beings and as leaders, we have a choice for ourselves and of course, how we influence those around us, our team, our bosses and our organizations. Do we see diverse inclusion as a segregated work stream that can be deprioritized when people are operating on system one thinking? Or do we see it as a methodology for how we can enable greater results, greater community, greater you know, outcomes by actually thinking of it as a methodology? And I was really proud that over about a year, in many often a crisis situation, women and the men of the London Organising Committee generally embraced diverse inclusion as a methodology. How can we make the uniforms more inclusive? How can we empower our volunteers, whoever they are? How can we make the opening ceremony more inclusive? How can we make the food we serve more inclusive? How can we make the security and the transportation more inclusive? How can we make the venues more accessible? And to think about this and what we do so that we have better outcomes for all of us. I'll give you one quick reminder. This is a picture that I took four years prior, in 2008, at the Beijing Paralympic Games. You can see here the view that I had of the sport over the center line. And this is a very privileged position to be in, a nice bouquet of flowers. I might have had a beverage in my hand at the time, and I've got a great view of the sport. My colleague was a wheelchair user. Dave was a wheelchair user who was watching this sport with me at the time. And this is his view of that sport. My view and his view. And it just goes to show that having blind spots or not being inclusive in our decision making has serious ramifications. And this is a very literal interpretation, a very literal result of that. But of course, it's also an analogy and a euphemism for all the organizational decisions we have to make every day. Are we thinking inclusively or do we have blind spots and we're excluding people resulting in worse outcomes? These are some of the women and men who thought about diversity inclusion as part of their day job, who led inclusively. Eight years on, it's more of a virtual world than it was then, but the principles still apply. So there's five that I wanna take you through, starting with empathy. The COVID-19 emergency really needs a people first approach. And therefore, whatever role you're in, however you're feeling, whatever the challenges may be, starting with empathy is a really good idea. Now, often in corporate life, empathy has been downplayed as a qualitative rather than quantitative thing, as a nice to have rather than a core business acumen. But actually empathy is critically important. Here's some things you can think about. When you're, for example, working virtually, bear in mind that not everyone has designated space to work. We might see the CEO in her or his lobby or study. We might even be in their garden with a very nice background. But you might have somebody who's in shared housing, who's actually sharing accommodation with housemates, who can't afford to have dedicated workspace. So one simple thing you can do, if for example, you're on Microsoft Teams, is blur your backgrounds. So actually to kind of level the playing field in terms of whether you're sitting in a mansion or a shared apartment. Not everyone has designated space to work. Something I need to constantly get better at is pausing more often to read the room. One of the reasons I put polls in here is it's a way of sensing the room when you've got lots of people on the call 
and you might not otherwise be able to read the cues. Pause them off from the normal and read the room and try and interpret that feedback to guide your decision making. Bear in mind, of course, there's a social aspect to work when you work physically together. For right now, particularly for people on their own, this is a key part of human contact. And how that video call goes, how that phone call with the boss goes, how that team meeting goes, is more important now than ever. And it's important to think about the social and human aspects of work besides just the economic and commercial ones. So thinking about the role that you play in team well-being and helping resilience when people are working remotely. For anybody on this call right now who doubts their ability to make an impact, think about this empathy slide. You can email or call or get in touch with almost anyone in your organization in a way that was perhaps not the social norm pre-COVID. And you can actually share empathy and check in. How are they doing? You might be very surprised at the results you get. And if we are coaching other people on empathy, perhaps the people whose cognitive load is so high, their empathy quotient is quite low. Here's just a few of the simple things we can think about. Humanize work, connect with people, actually ask questions and use it as an opportunity to do some in the moment coaching. Active listening, did I hear you right? Admitting when you're wrong and actually just checking in, repeating what's been said, paraphrasing it and reflecting back to check comprehension. It's even more to check we've understood we've been empathetic in real time, virtually, than it is in person. And above all else, validate emotions. An emotion isn't right or wrong, it just is. So if your team member is not feeling so great, then that is not wrong, it's how they're feeling. So validate it and acknowledge it because you'll get a far better response from them as a consequence. A second thing for us to think about is decision-making. Now decision-making, is more important now than ever. I just published an article on Forbes about tackling racism as a core part of actually saving lives in this COVID-19 ep epidemic. The decisions we make right now, often very fast in the moment, are even more important than before. If we do not include diversity in the design process for vaccines for COVID-19, we will not produce vaccines that save lives equitably. If we do not consider the decisions that we make in furloughing staff, our organizations will become less diverse. If we do not consider inclusion in the decisions that we make, we actually could determine not only the futures of our companies, but lives and deaths. So it's critically important to take inclusion seriously in terms of the decisions that we make at this moment. Here's some practical things. We all know about in and out groups, right? reflect on our in-groups, our closest friends, our closest colleagues, our neighbors, our partners. But think even more right now about your out-group. Think about who's not in your in-group and who might actually appreciate you reaching out to them. Not only for their benefit, but for yours to inform your decision-making. Before you make those big decisions, have you spoken to somebody you might not normally consult? Because you might get critical data which will de-risk the decision you're about to make. So thinking about them is more important than ever. Making that extra effort to call on people from your out group is more important than ever. Your brain needs to make decisions in a different way with different data points. You can't just call on people that you normally would around the office. So think strategically and preemptively and super consciously about the data points that you need to make a good decision and then act on them. Hopefully these are just some really practical things that can help you make better decisions at this time because your organizations need you now more than ever. The third thing I'd like us to think about in terms of inclusive leadership in a virtual world is participation. Seeing now as an opportunity to ask more, to listen more, to involve more. And practically, here are some thoughts. In terms of getting the most out of your people, in this tech virtual world. Simple things. Have icebreakers. We know from the research that if you ask everybody to introduce themselves at the start of a meeting, albeit not practical 
with 650 of you on the call. But in smaller team meetings, if we do that, we know that then there will be more equitable distribution of conversation resulting in had you not done that. It could be as simple as, how was your weekend? You know, what's the best thing that's happened to you in the last week? But if everyone has 10 seconds to contribute at the start of the meeting, a way of just warming up the vocal cords, there will be more participation and probably better participation in decision-making And had you not done that. Use the pay it forward approach. So if you're on one of those really awkward calls with lots of people and people talking over each other who aren't used to remote working, the pay it forward approach can be really helpful. That's where simply I call on the next person to speak. So if you're chairing the meeting, have a list of the participants to hand and make sure you're going through checking who's spoken and contributed. So I can call the next person, they can call the next person and so forth until everyone's been included in the decisions that are made. Rotate the chair. Hearing yourself talk at a screen can sometimes be unnerving, let me tell you. So actually try rotating the chair in the meeting and actually listening as well as chairing and getting different perspectives. And consider assigning roles for the efficiency of those meetings and ensuring maximum inclusion and contribution. You can have, for example, somebody whose job is to be the devil's advocate, to assign that role to somebody. And their job is to try and give the counterfactual to every point and every decision that's being made. And because they've been assigned that role, they'll have greater psychological safety to take on that role and it will help you in the decisions that you're about to make. Fourthly, self-awareness. Self-awareness sounds so simple, doesn't it? But actually, it's more important than ever. If you want to lead, in lead inclusively in a virtual world, we have to be more self-aware than ever before. So I'm gonna give you a simple test right now. And it's a test some of you might have seen before, particularly those I've worked with. But if not, see what you think of this. Hopefully right now in front of you, you can see a checkerboard, a chessboard. And you can see that there's a shadow being cast across that chessboard by the green cylinder. And you can hopefully see two squares, one marked A at the top of the screen and one marked B slightly lower down. And if I asked you, are those squares the same color or a different color, most people would say they're different colors, that A seems darker than B. Well, let's check that out. If we actually look at those squares and we put this black frame around them, we can see actually that they're pretty similar colors. In fact, if we add this extra bar as well, we can see that in fact, A and B are the same color. Yet actually at the beginning, we saw those completely different colors. How could that possibly be? And of course, this is bias. This is something we've talked about for a long time and know very much about, but it's more important than ever to be aware of this. Anyone is susceptible to bias. All of us have bias. It's a natural, normal function of the human brain, but it's more important than ever right now in a virtual world to remember that it's not our eyes that compute the colors of those squares, it's our brain. And it's our brain that's basically had pre-existing uh, information there, which frames what we see and actually doesn't give us accurate information. Our own mind is tricking us. And we need to be aware of that. A and B are the same, not different. So self-awareness, think about just some simple facts. What is your starting point? What is your normal? Thinking about who you are and your values and your norms, that's your starting point. Remember your in-group, that's your idea of what normal is. But of course, everyone's normal is different. And good decisions come from multiple starting points calibrated to get a more accurate averaged answer. How are you getting feedback? Are you just calling the people that you're friends with? Are you calling people who you find easiest to talk to or you already agree with? Or are you getting feedback from your out-group and challenging the decisions that you're about to make? Are you pausing frequently to reflect right now? Am I talking too fast? I'm conscious I've got an English accent and I have to be even slower and enunciate certain words. People were not used to an English accent. I need to pause. And I also need to check my stress levels and take breaks. Remember that stress can be you stress, positive, but distress, negative, and to be avoided. But it's important to make sure that wherever possible, we are making decisions from a position of you stress and from calm, calm positioning. It's never really a great place to make decisions when you're particularly stressed. Can they be parked for another day, 
Can you take a walk, step away from the computer, and come back and make those decisions when you're in a better frame of mind to do so? The final point. The final point I want to make is about focus. Focus, of course, on you, on yourself. But focus on those around you. This is, of course, about us leading inclusively in a virtual world, but it's also about us simply being a better human being. The human brain is not designed for multitasking. Part of my own self-awareness journey is that I know that I'm definitely not designed for multitasking. So one thing that I've tried to do is that when I'm working, I try to work. Right now, I'm trying to be very, very focused on this webinar and very, very focused on how it's going and relating to getting them my points across and to helping you in the work you're doing. When I'm working generally, I might try something like the Pomodoro technique, which is working in 20 minute increments so that you work very focused for a set period of time and then step away, walk, make a tea or coffee, take some fresh air and come back. When you're working, work. But when you're with family, or with loved ones or with friends, be with them, be fully present with them. And by trying to segregate these, by having really focused time at work and really focused time with friends and family, we have the possibility of getting more than the sum of the parts. By actually trying to have true well being and true life balance through being predetermined about our focus, being focused on work, walking away, being focused on loved ones. I'd like to ask you the final poll. At the beginning of this webinar, I asked you, how are you feeling in your body and your mind right now? And I'd like to ask you the same question again. So thanks to Ben, we're gonna pose that question right back to you and ask, how are you feeling in your body and mind right now? So what's great is thank you again, a truly high participation rate. And I am gonna take heart from this, that the bell curve has shifted, that that kind of number three has become more of a number four and people are feeling better than they did 40 minutes ago. So that's a collective effort, thank you. But it just shows that we have the possibility within ourselves as humans and as professionals to shift this to actually feel better in our body and mind right now. And imagine the consequences of making a decision right now, having seen that result, compared to having made a decision 40 minutes ago, having seen that result, right? This is you voting for a period of 40 minutes, taking the time of your busy lives to dig down deep reflection on diversity inclusion and leading inclusively in a virtual world. So that gives me heart, thank you. What we didn't have time to get to is, of course, many other things that you can think about. But I'd be very happy to pick up on these in Q&A or with you at any point after this webinar. We've gone through empathy, the importance of empathy in the decisions and the leadership that we demonstrate. Decision making. Who are we calling on for data points? Participation. Are we including everybody, not just to do the right thing, but to make sure we make the best decisions? How self-aware are we? Are we starting with our own bias and checking that before we actually lead others? And are we focused? Are we giving 100% to our work, but then 100% to our loved ones and the people that we need around us for strength, solidarity, and love and perspective? Other things we can then go on to think about would be technical inclusion. Many of us have different levels of technical ability. And actually, are we facilitating everyone's inclusion in these decision makings in the virtual world? Timing. It's not just West Coast versus East Coast. It's also, for example, those with parenting or caring responsibilities who might actually need to do homeschooling or make the lunch or the dinner or do bedtime. Are we having meetings at inclusive times and giving people time to balance the home and work? Thinking, of course, about bias deep down, deep dive, how is that playing out? And maintaining good practice. That, you know, performance reviews go on. Bullying and harassment is still a critical thing to be aware of. We maintain good practice in our people practices. 
and then we constantly have one eye on the future, the future vision. This will pass. We will get past this health emergency and we will get past the economic emergency. What does that future look like? And are we ready for it? Are we preparing for that future and making diversity and inclusion, making inclusive leadership a key part, not only of getting there, but of the success that we can enjoy once we arrive? We have the opportunity to learn from yesterday, to live for today and to hope for tomorrow. But as Albert Einstein said, the important thing is not to stop questioning. It's important for us to pause, to think, to reflect on what we've just discussed in the last 40 minutes and apply it to our own situation. We can lead inclusively in this virtual world and this choice remains. Can we double down to ensure that we are including inclusion in the decisions that we make rather than it being deprioritized at a time when it's needed more than ever? Pause, think, and apply to your own situation. Now, I said at the very beginning of this webinar that I was privileged to give a keynote at the Formal Workplace Inclusion eight years ago. It was called the Inclusion Imperative. And it was how we made diverse inclusion and inclusive leadership a key part of the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. I remain convinced that the inclusion imperative is more imperative than ever. That right now, in this time, we need inclusion more than ever. And you are the people to do that and to lead that. There will never be enough time and there will never be enough resources. But one thing that we do have that is free of charge, that is in infinite supply and completely within our own control, is our own ability to lead inclusively. I urge you to seize that opportunity. I thank you very, very much for joining us today. And I look forward to the questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, so much for that truly phenomenal webinar. Uh, just so timely and just, again, just so phenomenal. Thank you so much. And thank you to Frost included, um, to Rafi and Stephen for this wonderful mini series. And thank you for volunteering to bring this to us all. Um, that's right, they're not getting paid for this. <laughs> they're doing this for free. So <laughs> thank you, Stephen. Um, and yeah, as you said, we're gonna jump right into the questions. With so many people on, we will not be able to get to all the questions, but Stephen has shared his contact information and we'll also share that in the follow-up email with the survey so that you can contact him with any questions that um, that don't get answered or if you have, you know, just want to learn more um, about inclusive leadership, please feel free to contact. But uh, we're going to jump right in with the first question from our dear friend, Deb Daggett. Um, Stephen, can you talk about the role of allies leveraging their situational power and privilege to speak up for people feeling on the outside and or feeling too vulnerable to speak up about how they are struggling? Great. Thank you, Ben. And thank you, Deb. I mean, a big shout out to you. It's wonderful to be in touch. <laughs> uh, and thank you so much for this important question. Um, crikey, where to start? So I can start, I guess, with myself, that I am a very privileged white man, right? Uh, I'm very conscious of that. Um, I'm gay, I come from a very underprivileged background, but I certainly have a very privileged position right now in terms of academia, in terms of access to business leaders and so forth. So how am I using that? Well, one thing I did yesterday was write an article on the racial aspects of COVID-19 for Forbes magazine, which has been published uh, overnight. And of course, that's something I have to be very conscious of because I'm white, I'm male and privileged, and I'm talking about the disproportionate impacts on black and Asian minority ethnic people from this disease and this virus. In doing that, I liaise with lots and lots of colleagues and friends and team members who identify as uh, people of color, as black, as ethnic minority. And so it was a team effort. But because I had the in with the editor, I was able to use that to get that platform out there. Um, so I think thinking deep down about all of us and the roles we play, whether it's in diversity, whether it's a CEO, an HRD, a leader of talent, what is the power that we have? What is the access that we have? And who are we actually doing that for? Um, for me, when I read the news and I see the racial impact of COVID-19, this is something which needs talking about. 
And so for me to talk to people and to ask people, there's nothing about us without us, how can we get a better audience and get more profile for this important topic is something that I've got to do. So, you know, Deb is a wonderful example of, of doing this. I mean, Deb, not only for her work, you know, throughout diversity and inclusion, but if I think particularly her allyship with the LGBTQ plus community, Deb has acted as an ally to that community to advance rights for others as well. So I think whoever we are on this call, starting with the things I've gone through, self-reflection and so forth, being aware of who we are and the privileges we have, who can we reach out to who does not have those privileges and how can we partner to advance them? And there are examples, for example, from the LGBTQ plus history movement of lots and lots of straight allies being critical and advancing that. So right now, one thing I'm focused on is how can lots of white people on this call be allies to the issue of you know, racial discrimination that's happening with this disease? And I think therefore anyone on this call who's white could reflect on that and actually can reach out to colleagues and friends, people of color to say, well, actually, you know, what are we doing about this? So whether it's LGBTQ, whether it's race, whether it's disability, whether it's any aspect, think about that. What one very simple one I would just say is something I'm acutely aware of. You know, I, I'm in lockdown here in London in a nice apartment with my partner and it's kind of going okay. I mean, occasionally we want to, you know, like, you know, have time out from each other, but it's going, to, going okay. I'm very conscious at the moment of people who are in lockdown on their own, right? Who are isolating on their own. Call them, reach out, you know, be aware of that. And so there's all these things we need to think about. It starts, I think, with, with self-awareness. Thank you so much, Stephen. And on kind of on that note, what kind of unconscious bias is, is more likely to creep up during this time of isolation and lockdown and during this pandemic? Yeah, and thank you much, Sandra, for that, for that question. Um, I think loads. I mean, you, you might remember that kind of the wheel that Catalyst did a few years ago with, you know, hundreds of types of bias that, that, are, that manifest themselves. I think, you know, rather than we go through all of those, uh, you know, the things that immediately spring to mind are, are confirmation bias and I think affinity bias. So confirmation bias would be that, you know, we've got our pre-existing uh, thoughts already and then we look for evidence and data to support that existing hypothesis and we discount information data which doesn't support it. That leads us to potentially carry on down a route which is folly, to carry on down a route which is actually inaccurate. So we have to, I think, check our confirmation bias by preemptively and consciously looking for the counterfactual to challenge it. And of course, if, hypo if our hypothesis is strong and, and good, then it will withstand these counterfactuals. But we ought to do that to, to check that confirmation bias. I think another one is affinity bias, which I've kind of touched on throughout this webinar that at times of fear, we tend to stick to our own kind and we tend to hunker down to those that we already know. Now, of course, there's an element of human need in that, right? We all need love and security and safety, of course, but we also need to make accurate decisions. And so we need to be conscious of affinity bias, being that we don't just go to those people who we already know to be true. You know, one thing I'm giving the British government a hard time about at the moment is that their key scientific advisory committee is largely white men. Now, that cannot be good for developing an inclusive approach to future vaccines. There are 80 vaccines on trial at the moment in the UK, and we have to have, you know, racial diversity and input to inform the development of those vaccines. So think about affinity bias, I think, is critical right now, as we've learned from the financial crisis 12 years ago. Thank you. And um, your another question from David Leach. Your suggestion to blur backgrounds is, in a video meeting to minimize differences in working environment is at odds with another objective to personalize interactions by opening a window into our personal homes. Is there a way to do both? David, thank you very much for pointing out my contradictions. Mm -hmm. um, I I'm definitely a, a, a technological newbie that's learning to, uh, to, to virtualize my work. Um, I think the short answer is yes, there is a way to do both, and that's by asking, right? Um, I think if we ask people, you know, oh, do people want to kind of go on blurred backgrounds or not, right? People who, you know, might be embarrassed about the might say, actually, yeah, that'd be great. 
you know, they could even message you privately to say, actually, could you mention the blurred backgrounds thing at the start of the call? That'd be great, right? Because it's better than people just kind of going off video, right? Because you'll get some people who don't want to share their video. And so I think doing that before the meeting might be a good idea. On the other hand, um, you know, and again, I guess from a position of privilege, I've been talking to a few CEOs and HRDs recently where you zoom straight into their living room or their study, uh, or in some cases their garden. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, the big bad CEO uh, is suddenly there in a, you know, a hoodie uh, and, a, and a, you know, T-shirt on the sofa and they've got kind of their child coming in with the iPad wanting to talk about a cartoon or, a, you know, a, a child's video. And it's very humanizing, actually. So I, I think in terms of when I say ask, it's what are you trying to achieve? And for me with the CEO, um, I kind of want to get them out of their role and humanize them. And so I want to see into their world and, and, and get that going on. But perhaps for people who've got less power or less privilege, giving them the opportunity to say, can we all kind of go on blurred backgrounds might also be a, a way to do it. So I hope, David, that wasn't a fudged answer, but was trying to be a platinum rule answer of, of you know, asking people what would work for them. But I know that so far I've been kind of fumbling my way through both of those approaches. Thank you. Um, can't have all the answers all the time. <laughs> um, so this next one is a combination of two very similar questions. It's how do we encourage empathy among staff who are working out of fear? Amazing Kelly Jones. Question. Yeah, I mean, thank you, Kelly, for that question. That's, that's amazing. Um, I think, you know, empathy isn't just asking others to have empathy, right? It's, it's starting with ourselves, right? So if I'm being very unempathetic by asking somebody who's fearful to be empathetic, that's kind of doubly ironic, right? Um, so I think, you know, starting with ourselves, right? Um, if someone's in fear, then we've got to be empathetic about that to start with, right? and whether it's kind of giving them the opportunity to talk one-on-one, -on -one, private, offline, in a format that works for them, to kind of understand more about that fear, us displaying empathy, that might then elicit some reciprocity in them, right? Conversely, of course, if it's somebody with more power or status who really ought to be displaying empathy and who really ought to be dealing better with their fear, they may actually not feel able to display that vulnerability. We know that, of course, one of the big problems with leadership in corporations around the world, particularly amongst male leadership, is a, a, a fear or reluctance to display vulnerability. So how can we actually, again, get people one-on-one -on -one to kind of give them the opportunity to talk about that before they go in a more group dynamic setting? Practically, one thing that we've done on that has been to mix up the one-to-one -one kind of private conversations with the group collective conversations and really giving leaders and colleagues the opportunity to explore their cognitive dissonance, the gap between what they say and what they really do. And, and to give them that opportunity to be honest in private, and then as much as possible, translate that to the public sphere of the team meeting. So quite practically, if you're able to do those one-on-ones before any group interaction or pick up afterwards, that would definitely help. Thank you. And can you say more about ways to ensure and support executive leadership to use system two thinking for strategic decisions they make, furlough, layoff, financial support, et cetera, yeah. from James uh, Williams? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for that. I think, um, again, you know, this is a really, really important question, isn't it? Because, um, you know, how do you kind of persuade somebody to be inclusive who's not ready to receive? And I think it's about framing it in, in a way that works for them. Again, the platinum rule, right? So for me, I guess my agenda is inclusion because I believe in inclusion and believe it's not only the morally right thing to do, but it can make organizations better. Fact, right? We've got evidence for that. But if I'm talking to somebody who's uh, in system one and fearful, um, me going in saying inclusion, inclusion, inclusion might not work, right? It might kind of backfire. So if I go in actually by saying, how can I help? You know, what are you worried about right now? What's top of your list? And then really go in that way, it probably stands you a better chance of success. So if I think right now about many organizations either canceling or postponing diversity inclusion work, if I go in there and say, you mustn't, you mustn't cancel diversity inclusion work, it may reinforce their confirmation bias 
that this is a segregated work stream and a cost and should be deprioritized. If I go in there and say, actually, you know, why are you doing this? Or what are you most worried about? Or, you know, trying to empathize, it might then come around to them realizing, oh, yeah, I kind of forgotten or underappreciated that inclusion is, a much, is as much about decision-making as it is about groups of people. And it's actually, yeah, decision-making is more important than ever right now. So I think trying to start with them rather than you and their agenda rather than your agenda and the platinum rule rather than you know, your, your, your own work might be one way of trying to do that. I don't want to, for a moment, pretend that it's necessarily easy, um, but I think, you know, we've got the luxury of being able to reflect on this conversation and take time out to prepare for those conversations when perhaps the other party hasn't. Thank you. Um, just, uh, just sorting through, it's looking at the time. We have, um, we are at 12 o'clock. Um, so I think just to be respectful of everyone's time, we're just going to do one more, one more question. Uh, sorry, yeah, exactly. It's a, no pressure, no pressure no at pressure. all. <laughs> um, well, this I feel is, uh, I think, pertinent and touching to what touches a lot of people right now. What advice would you have for a furloughed practitioner? How do you move forward knowing that your organization doesn't see this work as essential or methodological? Or, I'm oh, sorry, methodology, blah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really I mean, <laughs> no, no, I mean, thank you for this question. I mean, like, this is this is very important, right? It's, it's almost like where I started, that I want to acknowledge um, the situation and the pain and the suffering that's going on right now. And so the first thing I would do would be to reach out to that person and say, uh, hi, how are you doing? How can I help? Right? And, and indeed, if that person wants to get in touch, I'd be delighted to, to do that. Um, so I think that's, that for me would be the starting point, right? People first. But then I guess it would then be partnering with that person to strategize on, okay, so how are we going to crack this? How are we going to solve this? And it would be that, you know, we know, right, that diversity inclusion has got tremendous value to add. We know that inclusive decisions are superior to non-inclusive decisions. We know that right now this is needed more than ever. So therefore, how can we connect this knowledge with the need? And if the person isn't listening, uh, if the, the decision maker isn't listening, how can we kind of talk to others who do, right? Remember that the, the in and out groups aren't fixed. They themselves are diverse. So how can we actually kind of look at the stakeholder landscape, look at the organizational politics and work out actually who is more receptive, who's more allied and talk to them? Now, hopefully there might be somebody within the organization concerned, but maybe it's gonna be somebody outside, right? Maybe this is gonna be taking your skills and talent to an organization that truly values them, right? But I think every situation is different. And I'd start with that person first, and then I'd work with them to strategize on how they're gonna land it. And all I can do is share my own experience with our, with our own folks, right? That we are doing our best to actually match their talents and their skills to what's needed right now, to empathize with clients and to turn around this narrative of, you know, it's not needed or it's deprioritized into one of, it's never been more needed. How can we listen and empathize and match our skills with that need? Uh, thank you so much, Stephen. On that note, I think it's a perfect note to end on. I just want to thank you so much again and thank you to your entire team of Frost at Frost Included for bringing this wonderful content to us. And I want to thank everyone who participated in today's special webinar and the entire mini webinar series. As uh, promised, uh, I have the SHRM and HRCI activity IDs for you for the session. For SHRM, it is the number two zero dash B as in Victor, M Y or M as in Mary, Y Y R. And the HRCI activity ID is 522280. Um, my colleague Ernest has put, and put those in the chat. And for any of those who attended last week's uh, webinar, uh, the, I apologize, the HRCI activity ID wasn't correct. The correct one is 522278. 
And so those are the uh, for to receive CEU credits for this webinar. Um, I want to again, like I said, thank Stephen and Frost included. Um, I want to and all of you for joining. Please join us for our regularly scheduled May webinar, Workplace 2020: An Intersection of Diversity and Politics, with presenters Molly Carolyn and Tatiana Fredermeister on Thursday, May 21st, 2020, at 11 a.m. Central Time, and new episodes of the forum podcast are now available visit forum workplace inclusion.org forward slash podcast listen or you they are also available on apple Podcasts, spotify stitcher and more thank you again everyone for joining if you do want to um, continue the conversation with steven or learn more he, you can contact him at steven at frost or visit their website um, and like i said that will be included in the uh, survey email that you'll be receiving briefly. So I want to thank you all again for joining us and we hope you'll join us for future webinars. Thank you very much. Safe and well.